Good morning. Welcome to the Swan Analytical USA webinar series. My name is Dominic O'Donnell. I'm the marketing director at Swan Analytical USA. In just a moment, I'll introduce you to our speaker, Randy Turner. Uh, but first, I want to familiarize you with our webinar software. You should be seeing both our slide deck and what's called a go to meeting control panel towards the upper right of your screen. Uh, by default, you should be receiving the audio through your computer speakers, although if you're dialed in, you can click on the phone call option uh, to get your audio that way. Currently, we have all attendees muted to prevent background noise and distractions. We do still want to hear from you if you have any questions or feedback. And again, we can use the go to meeting control panel for that. Please type your questions and comments into the dialog box and send that off to me. I'll be monitoring the incoming questions and we'll address them at the conclusion of the webinar. Our speaker this morning is Randy Turner. Randy Turner has been the technical director at Swan Analytical USA since 2012. Prior to that, he served as corporate chemist and as a plant chemist at Southern Company for over 33 years. Over the years, he has authored numerous papers and been an active member of EPRI and ASME, including time as chairman of EPRI's cycle chemistry program. We're pleased today to have Randy share some of that experience with you. Randy, take it away. Thank you, Dominic. We're very excited uh, to talk to you today about steam purity and its implications. So what we're going to talk about today is a brief introduction on steam purity and things of that nature and why it's important. We will talk about degas conductivity and the methods of measurement. We'll talk briefly about cation exchanger design and how that impacts cation conductivity as well as degas conductivity measurement. Then we'll describe some of the measurement and design features of the SWAN degas conductivity monitoring system and then review some case studies and then summarize what we've talked about. In today's power generation with all the renewables, there's tremendous pressure to reduce startup times on our traditional units as well as our combined cycles. Cation conductivity is a key decisive measurement parameter for steam purity as well as condensating feed water. And today the focus is on providing fast, accurate cation conductivity values to facilitate fast startups. To have a fast and accurate cation conductivity, it's greatly influenced by the design of the sampling and monitoring system. But the key message is steam purity is critical to protect the assets. So why is steam purity so important? Well, you have a new steam turbine or a reconditioned steam turbine that's in pristine condition, has very high reliability and performance. However, operating over the years, we have chemistry upsets, you have contaminants entering the steam cycle, and those can form deposits, which leads to pitting on the steam turbine. And those pits lead to cracking, which can result in very expensive repairs and even catastrophic failure. The reason steam period is so important is you can have uh, corrosive contaminants such as chlorides and sulfates, as well as some other species that can form deposits on the steam turbine throughout various areas of the steam turbine. And those corrosive deposits lead to pitting during outage periods when the steam turbine is exposed to very humid oxygen saturated air. And when you, you bring the unit back online with the mechanical stresses, you can have cracks form between those pits and it can lead to corrosion fatigue failure of, of the blading and the discs in the phase transition zone of the LP turbine. You can also incur stress corrosion cracking of the blades and discs in the phase transition zone of the LP turbine. So the risk of turbine corrosion requiring expensive repairs can be significant if your steam purity is not 
acceptable and meeting OEM and industry guidelines. So where do these steam purity limits come from? Well, the OEMs such as Siemens, Austin, Toshiba, GE, as well as organizations such as EPRI, IOPS, and VGV. Therefore, values above normal operating limits may be tolerated for short periods of time, particularly during startup. However, the greater the deviation, the shorter the allowable duration operating outside the normal operating limits. So we're going to launch a, a quick poll here. We want to get your feedback. We feel that degas conductivity is a very critical parameter, but we'd like to know what you're seeing. What do you feel is the most important parameter when monitoring steam purity? Please go ahead and select one and hit send. See, we're starting to get some responses. We'll leave this open for just a few more seconds here until we get uh, a representative response. Over half our attendees have voted. We'll give it just a few more seconds here. Okay, it's a pretty good response, and let me just share that with you. What we've seen, well, looks like we may need to uh, follow up with some webinars on silica and sodium, but it looks like we've got the right topic for today with 71% of the people responding to us uh, agreeing with us that degas conductivity is as important a parameter as you're going to come across when monitoring steam purity. So um, we'll go ahead and close that up for now. And uh, back to you, Randy. Thank you, Dom. Okay, what you see in this table is the impact of different species on cation conductivity. The typical cation conductivity limit by OEMs as well as organizations like EPRI for normal operation is 0 0.2 microsiemens per centimeter. And what you see in the table is a list of common contaminants that can be in the steam. And the values beneath each contaminant is the concentration in PPB of that specific contaminant required to yield a cation conductivity of 0 0.2. And it can be a number of contaminants uh, that is driving the conductivity, or it can be dominated by one particular contaminant, such as carbon dioxide during startup conditions or during periods of high air leakage. The thing about carbon dioxide with respect to the steam turbine is it's not corrosive to the steam turbine. Therefore, it's, it's not an issue that would warrant restricting steam to the steam turbine during startup. However, when your concentrations of carbon dioxide are significantly elevated, it can drive the conductivity uh, to values of one microsiemen and higher thereby masking the presence of more corrosive species such as chlorides and sulfates, which are very corrosive to the steam turbine. Therefore, it's important to be able to get a more accurate measurement of the cation conductivity due to the presence of species such as chloride and sulfate. So when you're operating and your conductivity, kind of conductivity is 0 0.2 microsiemens, you have this question in the back of your mind. Is it due to the presence of 16 ppb of chloride or is it 46 ppb of CO2 or carbon dioxide or a combination thereof? What you see here are the OEM and the industry steam purity limits for various parameters such as organizations such as EPRI, IOPS, and the OEMs that you see listed here. And the typical cation conductivity limit for normal operation is less than or equal to two, 0 0.2 microsiemens. And then you look at silica is typically less than 10, sodium and chloride less than or equal to two, uh, sulfate as well. And many of you manufacturers 
accept the gas cation connectivity, at least for startup and commissioning, and now many of the OEMs accept the gas cation connectivity for normal operation. What you see in this table is semen steam purity limits for the various parameters listed, and it's specifically identifying the action levels uh, for the various parameters listed. And you see it goes from action level one to action level four, and it shows the range of the various parameters listed in which would identify which action level your steam chemistry is currently operating. Now, during startup, Siemens recommends that the steam purity should be in action level two in trending downward, which is identified by the uh, green lettering. So turbine sh startup with respect to Siemens guidelines should occur within action level two, as I said, with a downward trim. Now, let's talk a few moments about degas cation conductivity. As I mentioned earlier, most OEMs accept degas cation conductivity for startup and commissioning, but many of them now accept it for normal operation. Degas conductivity analyzer removes only carbon dioxide. It doesn't remove the corrosive anions such as chlorides and sulfates, or even organic acids that may derive from using organic treatment chemicals. According to Steve Schulder, EPRI Program 64 Manager, steam conductivity should be measured by degas cation conductivity and be less than 0.1 microsiemen per centimeter, independent of the treatment. Now, let's talk about steam purity limits. Cation conductivity alone could lead to delays based on OEM as well as uh, technical organizations such as EPRI. I've seen cation conductivities during startup as high as 1.5 microsiemens in my career, and it is predominantly being driven by carbon dioxide. The degas cation conductivity provides a more accurate, more complete picture of your steam purity with respect to cation conductivity. Therefore, of utilizing degas conductivity eliminates the guesswork on carbon dioxide's contribution to your cation conductivity. Let's talk about methods of degassing your sample to measure degas conductivity. Nitrogen sparging is one method, and it consistently removes around 70% of the carbon dioxide. Reboiling. Uh, in 2004, Dr. Nigel Drew did some research on degassing samples, and he evaluated the methods available at that time, nitrogen sparging and reboiling and um, gas transfer membranes, which we'll talk about in a moment. And during his study of the available technology, the nitrogen removed, sparging removed 70% of the CO2, and the reboiling removed 28 to 58%. And the reason for that variability in the reboiling is because the technology at the time did not take into consideration the actual boiling point temperature of the water, which is driven by the barometric pressure. So as the barometric pressure change, the actual boiling point temperature changes, affecting the efficiency of the CO2 removal by the reboiler. And then the third method he evaluated was, as I said, gas transfer membranes, which removed between 40 and 63% of the CO2. And this report is available in PPChem. Let's take a moment to talk about cation exchangers. What you see on the left is a traditional resin column cation exchanger whereby the sample flows from the top to the bottom 